The Lancashire Witches, Book the Second Pendle, Forest, Chapter 1, Flint. A lovely morning, so see the strange and terrible night. Brightly shone the sun upon the bare calder, as it winded along the green meads above the bridge, as it rushed rejoicingly over the weir, and pursued its rapid course through the broad plain below the abbey. Brightly shone the sun upon the noble timber, embowering the mansion of the ashes, upon the ancient gateway, in the upper chamber of which Ned Huddlestone, the porter, and the burly representative of Riot Oak was rubbing his sleepy eyes, preparatory to habiting himself in his ordinary attire, and upon the wide courtyard across which Nicholas was walking in the direction of the stables. Notwithstanding his excesses overnight, the squire was astir, as he had declared he should be before daybreak, and a plunge into colder had cooled his feverish limbs and cured his racking headache, while a draught of ale set his stomach right. Still in modern parlance, he looked rather seedy, and his record of the events of the previous night was somewhat confused. Aware he had admitted many fooleries, he did not desire to investigate matters too closely, and only hoped he should not be reminded of them by Sir Ralph, or worse still, by Parson Dewhurst. As to his poor dear uncomplaining wife, he never once troubled his head about her, feeling quite sure she would not upbraid him. On his appearance in the courtyard, the two noble bloodhounds and several lesser dogs came forward to greet him, and attended by the this noisy pack, he marched up to a groom who, rubbing down his horse, he was at the stable door. Poor Robin, he cried to the steed who neared at his approach. Poor Robin, he said, patting his neck affectionately. There is not thy match for speed or endurance for fence or ditch or beck or stone wall in the country. Half an hour on thy back will make all right me, but I would rather take thee to Borland Forest and hunt a stag there. Then go and perambulate the boundaries of the roughly estates with a rascally attorney. I wonder how the fellow will be mounted. If you'll be spearing about Mr. Hot Squire, observed the groom, I can't tell ye is to a little flint a Welsh pony. Why, zounds, you don't say so, Peter, exclaimed Nicholas, laughing. He'll never be able to manage him. Flint's the wickedest and most willful little brute I ever knew. We shall have Master Potts run away with or thrown into a mosque. Better give him something quieter. It's Sir Rolf's orders, replied Peter, and I darn a disobey him, for Flint's far steadier than when you seed him last, Squire. I dare say he'll carry Master Potts well enough if he he does not mislest him. You think nothing of the sort, Peter, said Nicholas. You expect to see the little gentleman fly over the pony's head and perhaps break his own as started. But if Sir Ralph has ordered it, he must abide by the consequences. I shan't interfere further. How does a young colt you were breaking in? You should take care to show him the saddle in the manger. Let him smell it and jingle the stirrups in his ears before he put it on his back. Better ground for his first lessons could not be desired than the field below the grange, near the calder. Sir Ralph was saying yesterday that the Rome mare had pricked her horse. You must wash the soul well with white wine and salt, rub it with ointment and varies called agitiacum, and then put upon it a hot plaster compounded of wax hearts, turpentine, oil, and wax, bathing the top of the hoof with all Armenia and vinegar. This is the best and quickest remedy. And recollect, Peter, that for a new strain, vinegar, ball, Armenia, white of eggs, and bean flour make the best salt. How goes on Sir Ralph's black charger, dragon? Brave horse that Peter, and the only one in your master's so to compare with my Robin. But dragon though of high courage and great swiftness, has not the strength and endurance of Robin neither. Can he leap so well? Why, Robin would almost clear the calder, Peter, and makes nothing of Smithy's brook near. Down him, and you know how wide that stream is. I once tried him at a ribble at a narrow point, and if all could have done it, he would, but it was too much to expect. A great deal, I should say, squire replied room, opening his eyes to their widest extent. Why, the ribble, where you see on a mun be twenty yards across, it be an inch, and no neither ever would Red could clear that unless a witch were on his side. Don't allude to witches, Peter, said Nicholas. I've had enough of them, but to come back to our seeds, colour is matter of taste, and a man must please his own eye with bay or grey, chestnut, sorrel, or black. But done is my fancy, a good horse, Peter, should be clean limbed, short jointed, strong hooved, out with broad chested, deep net, loose throttled, thin crested, lean headed, full eyed, with wide nostrils. A horse with half these points would not be wrong, and Robin has them all. So he has sure enough, Squire, replied Peter, regarding them animal with an approving eye, as Nicholas enumerated his merits. For if I match you between him and young Mr. Rusher, Asherton, Grey, Gelding, Merlin, I knows which I take. Robin, of course, said Nicholas. And 
as why it should be the other replied room. You're no judge of a horse, Peter rejoined Nicholas, shrugging his shoulders. Maybe not, said the groom, but I'm bound to speak true and see Tom Lomax is bringing out Merlin. We can put the two nags side by side if you choose. They shall be put side by side in the field, Peter. That's the way to test their respective merit, returned Nicholas, and they won't remain long together. I'll warrant you. I offered to make a match of twenty pieces with Master Richard, but he declined the offer. Harky Peter, break an egg in Robin's mouth before he put on his bridle. It strengthens the wind and adds to a horse's power of endurance. You understand? Perfectly, squire replied the room. By the mess I that's a secret worth knowing. Only more orders. No, replied Nicholas. We shall set out in an hour, or it may be sooner. I shan't be ready, said Peter, and he added to himself as Nicholas moved away. I just take care Tom Lomax gives an egg to Merlin, and that'll make a fair if they chance to try their oster's metal. As Nicholas returned to the house, he perceived to his dismay Sir Ralph and Parson Dewhurst standing upon the set and convinced from their grave looks that they were prepared to lecture him. He endeavoured to nerve himself for the impleasure. Two to one are open odds, said Squire to himself, especially when they have the vantage round. But I must face them and make the best fight circumstances will allow. I shall never be able to explain that mad dance with I saw the head and no one but Dick will believe me. And the chances are he will not support my story. But I must put on an air of penitence and soon say, in my present state, it is not very difficult to assume. Thus pondering with slow step, effectively humble demeanour, and surprisingly leaven visage, he approached the pair who were waiting for him, and regarded him with severe look. Thinking it the best plan to open fire himself, Nicholas saluted them and said, Give you good day, sir, Ralph, and you too, worthy master Dewurst. I scarcely expected to see you so early as sir, but sir, but the morning is too beautiful to allow us to be sluggards. For my own part, I have been awake for hours, and have passed the time wholly in self reproaches for my folly and sinfulness last night, as well as in forming resolution for self-amendment and better governance in future. I hope you will adhere to those resolutions. Then Nicholas joined Sir Ralph certainly. What a change of conduct is absolutely necessary if you maintain your character as a gentleman. I can make allowances for high animal spirits and can issue some license, so I do not approve of it. But I will not permit decorum to be outraged in my house and so so ill an example to be set to my tenantry. Fortunately, I was not present at the exhibition, said you were, but I am told you conduct yourself like one possessed and permitted such reasons as are rarely ever act by a rational being. I can offer no defence worthy, sir, and you, my respected relative, sir Nicholas, with a contract air, neither can you reprove me more strongly than I serve, nor than I pray myself. I allowed myself to be overcome by wine, and in that condition was undoubtedly guilty of all these I must ever regret. Among others, I believe you stood upon your head, remarked you were. I am not aware of the circumstance, reverend sir, replied Nicholas, with difficulty pressing a smile, but as I certainly lost my head, I may have stood upon it unconsciously, but I do recollect to make me heartily ashamed of myself and determined to avoid all such excesses in future. In that case, sir, rejoined you, as the occurrences of last night, though sufficiently discreditable to you, will not be without profit, for I have observed to my infinite regret that you are apt to indulge in immoderate occasions and went under their influence to lose your command of yourself and commit follies which your sober reason must condemn. At such times, I scarcely recognize you, you speak with unbecoming levity, and even allow all to escape your lips. It's too true, reverend sir, said Nicholas, so sounds a plague upon my tongue. It is an unruly member. Forgive me, good sir, but my brain is a little confused. I do not wonder from the grievous assault made upon it last night, Nicholas, observed Sir Ralph. Perhaps you are not aware that your crowning act was whisking wildly round the room by yourself like a dervish. I was dancing with I saw the head and said, Nicholas, with whom inquired you as in surprise, with a wicked votaress who has been dead nearly a couple of centuries, interposed Sir Ralph, and who by her sinful life merited punishment she is said to have incurred. This delusion shows how dreadfully intoxicated you were, Nicholas, for the time you had quite lost your reason. I am sober enough now at all events, rejoined Nicholas, and I am convinced that I saw the dance with me, nor will any arguments reason me out of this belief. I am sorry to hear you say so, Nicholas, returned Sir Ralph, that you were under the impression at the time I can easily understand but that you should persist. In such a senseless and wicked notion is more than I can comprehend. I saw her with my own eyes plainly as I see you. Sir Ralph like with only that I declare upon my honour and conscience I also felt the pressure of her arm. Whether it may not have been found in her likeness, I will not take on me to declare. And indeed, I have some misgivings on the subject. But what a beautiful creature, exactly resembling the Votterers, stands with me, I will ever maintain. If so, she was invisible to others, for I beheld her not, said Sir Ralph. And though I cannot yield credence to your explanation, yet granted it to be correct, I do not see how it mends your case. On the contrary, it only proves that matters 
and Nicholas yielded to the snares of Satan and Dewhurst shaking his head. I would recommend you long fasting and read prayer, my good sir, and I shall prepare a lecture for your special education, which I will propound to you on your return to Downham, and if it fails in effect, I will persevere over godly discourses. With your aid, I trust to be set free, Reverend Sir, return Nicholas, but as I have already passed two or three hours in prayer, I hope they may stand me in the light of any present fasting and induce you to omit article of penance or postpone it to some future occasion when I may be better able to form it, but I am just now particularly hungry, and I am always better able to resist temptation than an empty one. As I find it displeasing to Sir Ralph, I will not insist upon my visionary partner in the dance, at least until I am better able to substantiate the fact. I shall listen to your lectures with Sir Ralph, and I doubt not to be benefit in the meantime, as Colonel wants to be slide and mundane matters attended to. I pause with our excellent host's permission that we proceed to breakfast. Sir Ralph made no answer but ascended the steps, and was followed by Hewers heaving a deep sigh and turning the whites of his eyes, and by Nicholas, felt his boss ease of half his lord and secretly congratulated himself on getting out of his scrape so easily. In the hall they found Richard Ashton, habited in a riding dress, suited, third, and in all respect paired for the expedition. There were such evident traces of anxiety and suffering about him that Sir Ralph questioned him as to the cause, and Richard replied that he had passed a most restless night. He did not add that he had been made acquainted by Adam Whitworth with the midnight visit of the two girls to the conventual church, because he was well aware Sir Ralph would be greatly displeased by the circumstance, and because Mistress Nutter had expressed a wish that it should be kept secret. Sir Ralph, however, saw there was more upon his young relative's mind than he chose to confess, but he did not urge any further admission into his confidence. Meantime, the party had been increased by the arrival of Bass Potts, who was likewise equipped for the ride. The hour was too early, it might be, for him, or he had not rested well like Richard, or had been troubled with bad dreams, but certainly did not look very well for him, a very good humour. He had slept at the Abbey, having been accommodated with a bed after the sudden seizure, which he attributed to the instrumentality of Mistress Nutter. The little attorney bowed obsequiously to Sir Ralph, who returned his salutation very civilly, nor was he better to see by the rest of the company. A sign from Sir Ralph, his guests then knelt down, and the prayer was uttered by the divine, or rather a discourse, for it partook more of the last character than the former. In the course of it, occasion painting strong colours, terrible consequences of intemperance, and Nicholas was obliged to endure a well-merited lecture of half an hour's duration, but even Parson Dewar could not hold out for ever, and to the relief of all his hearers, he at length brought his discourse to a close. Breakfast at this period was a much more substantial affair than the modern morning repast, and differed a little from dinner or supper, except in respect to quantity. On the present occasion, there were carbonadoes of fish and fowl, cold charm, a huge pasta, a cap on the tongs, sausages, the targos, and other matters as provocative of first as sufficing to the appetite. Nicholas set to work bravely. Broiled trout, steaks, and a huge slice of venison venison pasta disappeared quickly for him, and he was not quite so sparing of the ale as seemed consistent with his previously expressed resolution of temperance. In vain, Parson Dewar filled the goblet with water and looked significantly at him. He would not take the hint, and turned a deaf ear to the admonitory cough of Sir Ralph. He had little help from the others, for Richard ate sparingly, and Master Potts made a very good figure beside him. At length, having cleared his plate, emptied his cup, and wiped his lips, the squire arose, and said he must bid a to his wife and should then be ready to attend them. While he quitted the hall for his purpose, Mistress Nutter entered it and looked paler than ever, and her eyes seemed larger, darker, and brighter. Nicholas shuddered slightly as she approached, and even Potts felt thrill of apprehension pass through his frame. He scarcely indeed ventured a look at her, for he dreaded her mysterious power, and feared she could perform the designs he secretly entertained against her, but she took no notice whatever of him, acknowledging Sir Ralph's salutation and motioning Richard to follow her to the farther end of of the room. Your sister is very ill, Richard, she said, as a young man attended her. Feverish and almost light-headed, Adam Whitworth has told you, I know, that she has imprudent enough in company with Alison to visit the ruins of the conventual church last night, and she there sustained some fright which has produced a great shock on her system. When found, she was fainting, and though I have taken every care of her, she still continues much excited and rambles strangely. You will be surprised as well as grieved when I tell you that she charges
Bewitches. Alison will have been bewitched, sir. How, madam? cried Richard. Alison bewitched, sir. It is impossible. You are right, Richard, replied Mr. Nutter. The thing is impossible, but the accusation will find easy credence among the superstitious household here and may be highly prejudicial, if not fatal, to poor Alison. And it is most unlucky she should have gone out in this way, for the circumstance cannot be explained, and in itself serves to throw suspicion upon her. I must see Dorothy before I go, said Richard. Perhaps I may be able to sue her. It was for that end I came hither, replied Mr. Sutter, but I thought it well you should be prepared now come with me. Upon this they left the hall together and proceeded to the abbey chamber where Dorothy was lodged. Richard was greatly shocked at the sight of his sister, so utterly changed she was from the blithe being of yesterday, then so full of health and happiness. Her cheeks burned with fever, her eyes were unnaturally bright, and her air hung about her face in disorder. She kept fast hold of Alison, who stood beside her. Ah, Richard, she cried on seeing him, I am glad you are come. You will persuade this girl to restore me to her reason, to free me from the terrors that set me. She can do so if she will. Calm yourself, dear sister, said Richard gently, endeavouring to free Alison from her grasp. No, do not take her from me, said Dorothy wildly. I am better when she is near me. Much better. My brow does not rob so violently, and my limbs are not twisted so painfully. Do you know what ails me, Richard? You were cold, cold, and wandering out indiscreetly last night, said Richard. I am bewitched, rejoined Dorothy, in tones that pierced her brother's brain. Bewitched by Alison device, by your love. Ha ha, she wishes to kill me, Richard, because she thinks I am in her way. But you will not let her do it. You are mistaken, dear Dorothy. She means you. No harm, said Richard. Heaven knows how much I grieve her, and how fondly I love her, exclaimed Alison tearfully. It is false, cried Dorothy. You will tell a different tale when you are gone. She is a witch, and you will never marry her, Richard. Never, never. Mistress Nutter, who stood at a little distance, anxiously observing what was passing, waved her hand several times towards the sufferer. But I'll bet I have no influence over her, she muttered. She is really bewitched. I must find other means to quiet her. Though all greatly distressed, Alison and Richard redoubled their attention to all the work for a few moments. She remained quiet, but with her eyes constantly fixed on Alison, and then said quickly and fiercely, I have been told if you scratch one who will wish you till you draw blood, you will be cured. I will punch my nails in the flesh. I will not oppose you, replied Alison gently. Tear my flesh if you will. You should have my life blood if it is you, you. But if the success of the experiment depends on my having bewitched you, it will assuredly fail. This is dreadful, in order to leave her, Alison. I entreat of you, she will do you. And endure it. I care not, replied the young man. I will stay by her till she voluntarily releases me. The almost tigress fury with which Dorothy had seized upon the unresisting girl, he has suddenly deserted her and sobbing hysterically, she fell upon her neck. Oh, with what delight Alison pressed her to her. Dorothy, dear Dorothy, she cried. Alison, dear Alison, what the Dorothy. Oh, how would I suspect you of any ill design against me? She is no wish, she is sister, be assured of that, said Richard. Oh, no, no, no. I am quite sure she is not right or a kiss in her affectionately. This change has been brought by the law of the cells of Mr. Nutter. The access is over. She mentally ejaculated, but I must get him away for the turn. You had better go now, Richard, she added aloud and touching his arm. I will answer for your sister's restoration and all here will produce sleep and impossible. She shall return to my new turn today. If I go, Alison must go with me, said Dorothy. Well, well, I will not thwart your desires, John Mr. Nutter, and she made a and to reach her to depart. The young man pressed his sister's hand, bade a tender farewell to Alison, and infinitively relieved by the improvement which had taken place in former, and which he firmly believed would speedily lead to her entire restoration, descended to the entrance hall, where he found Sir Ralph and Parson Dewars, who told him that Nicholas and Potts were in the courtyard, and impatient to set out. Shouts of laughter saluted the ears of the trio as they descended the steps. The cause of the merriment was speedily explained when they looked toward the stable, and beheld Potts struggling for mass with a stout Welsh born who shook every disposition by plunging, kicking, and rearing to remove him from his seat. So, without success, for the attorney was not quite such a contemptible horseman as might he imagine. A wicked looking little fellow was lent with a rough black coat, a big tail that swept round and mean to match an eye of misfire and cunning. When brought or he had allowed Potts to mount him quietly and not, but no sooner was the attorney comfortably in possession than he was served with a notice of he get down, went to his head, and up went his heels, while on the next instant he Rearing a lot with his four feet, beating the air so nearly perpendicular that the chances seemed in favour of his coming down on his back. Then he whirled suddenly round, shook himself violently, threatened to roll over, and performed antics the most extraordinary kind to the dismay of his rider, but to the infinite amusement of the spectators who 
were ready to split their side while the indie tears fairly streamed down Squire's cheeks. However, when Sir Ralph appeared, it was thought desirable to put an end to them. Peter, the groom, advanced to seize the restive little animal bridle, but eluding the grass when started off at the gallop, and accompanied by the two bloodhounds, careered round the courtyard as if running in a ring. Vainly did Paul Potts tug at the bridle, Flint having the bit firmly between his teeth, fired his utmost efforts. Away he went the hounds at his heels, as if said Nicholas, the devil, were behind him. Though annoyed and angry, Sir Ralph did not help laughing at the ridiculous scene, and even a smile across Parson to her slave countenance as Flint and his rider scampered might pass them. Sir Ralph all to the room, and attempts were instantly made to check the furious horny's career, but he backed them all, swerving suddenly round when an endeavour was made to intercept him, leaping over any trifling obstacle, and occasionally charging anyone who stood his path. What with the room running hither and thither, vociferating and swearing, barking and Ringing of the hounds and the yelping of lesser dogs and the screaming of old trade of all yard was in a state of war and confusion. Flint Mun be possessed, cried Peter. I never see him go on I this way for I know his deliverer. Device near the stable last night, and I should not wonder if you had to wish him now down on the quiet and the room. How some of her women can try to catch him on the rolling send us all about our business. I wish you can try to do it then Tom Law Max replied Peter, but I'm barely low. Dang me if I ever see sick pay or my what I my own days. What's to be young squire? He added to Nicholas. The devil only knows to lie the latter, but it seems we must wait till the little rascal chooses to stop. This occurred sooner than we were better thinking possibly that he had only my spots to give all idea of riding him. Flint suddenly slackened his pace and trotted as if nothing had happened to the stable door. But if he had formed any such motion as he or he was deceived or the attorney, who was quite as obstinate and willful as himself, and who, through all his perils, had managed to maintain his seat, was resolved not to abandon it and positively lose his mouth when urged to do so by Nicholas and the room. He will go quietly enough now, I dare say, observe Pops, and if not, and you will lend me a hunting whip, I will understand, cure him. Flint seemed to understand what was said, for he laid back his ears as if meditating more mischief. But being surrounded by the room, he deemed it advisable to postpone the attempt to the mark in In compliance with his request, a heavy hunting whip was handed to heart and armed with this formidable weapon. The little attorney quite long for an opportunity of everything is betrayed. Meanwhile, Sir Ralph came up and ordered a steady horse out of him. But Master Hart's ear to his resolution and Flint remaining perfectly quiet, the Baronet let him have his own way. Soon at this, Nicholas and Richard having mounted their seats, the party set forth as they were passing through the gateway, which had been drawn wide up by Ned Huddleston. They were rejoined by Simon Farshot, who had been engaged by Hart to attend him on their addition to his past year constable. Simon was mounted on a mule, brought word that Master Roger Norwell begged they would ride round by the hall, where he would be ready to accompany them, as he wished to be present at a perambulation of the boundaries, sent him to the arrangement part set off in that direction, Richard and he was riding a little in advance of the agreed all. The road taken by the party on Richard Wally led to the side of a hill, which broken into picturesque inequalities and partially equal the trees, slowed down to the very brink of the calder. Mixed with the warbling of innumerable beverage songsters were heard the cheering notes of the country, and the newly arrived swallows were seen chasing the flies along the lane or skimming over the surface of the river. Already had Richard's depression yielded to the exhilarating freshness of the morning and the same kind of influence produced on Mars. The Lutheri effect on Nicholas and Parson Dewhurst and Fletcher had been able to accomplish. The worthy squire was a true lover of nature, admiring her in all her forms, whether arrayed in pomp or wood and verdure as in the lovely landscape or in or dreary and desolate as in the heath and forest ways that were about to traverse. While breathing the fresh morning air, inhaling the fragrance of the wild hours, so listening to the warbling of birds and her well pleasing survey of the scene in the bridge passing over walling nab and the mountainous circle conjoined with it till his gaze settled on Morton Hall, a noble mansion finely situated on a shoulder of the hill beyond him and commanding the entire valley. Were I not owner of Downham, he observed to Richard, I should wish to be master of Morton. And then, pointing to the green sea below, he added, what a capital spot for a race. There we might try the speed of our nags for the twenty pieces I told of yesterday, and the judges of the match and those who choose to look on might station themselves on yon knoll, which 
seems made for the express purpose. Three years ago, I remembered a fair was held on that plane, and the foot races, the wrestling matches, and the various sport and pastimes of the rustics viewed from the knoll. The prettiest that ever looked on the pleasant as our set is, we must not tarry here all day. Before setting forward, he cast a glance toward Pendle Hill, which formed the most prominent object of view on the left, and lay like a Levivan basket in the sunshine. The vast mass rose gradually until at its further extremity it attained an altitude of more than 1800 feet above the sea. At the present moment it was without cloud, and the whole of its road outline was distinctly visible. I love Pendle Hill, cried Nicholas enthusiastically, and from whatever side I view it, whether from this place, where I see it from end to end, from its lowest point to its highest, from Paddyham, where it frowns upon me, from Liverpool, where it smiles, or from Downham, where it rises in old majesty before me, from all points and from all aspects, whether robed in mist or radiant sunshine, born to me, a giant shadow, I look upon it with fire the old cigar, and some walks say Pendle Hill wants to run your and sublimity, they themselves must be born to their taste, this road round the street, mass is better than the others, craggiest, shaggiest, most sharply singed mountain of them all, and then what a view it commands, Lancaster, the grey old church on one hand, York, the revered minister on the other, the Irish sea and its wild horse, Bell Forest, Morph and Valley, both by the river, other, Calder, the Lime River, not too much of winter, and you recollect the old estate, Ingleborough, Pendle Hill, and Pennington, are the highest hills between Scotland and Francis Vouchers, for its height, there are two other doggly lines, still more to her. Pendle Hill, Pennington, and Ingleborough are three such hills I shall not find by seeking England for her. this opinion, I quite agree, there is no hill in England like Pendle Hill. Every man to his taste, squire, observe, but to my mind, Pendle Hill has no other recommendation than its size. I think it's a great brown, blade lumpy mass, without beauty or form or any striking character. I hate your bleak Lancashire hills, with heathy ranges on the top, it's only for the sustenance of the ball half starved sheep, and as to view from them, it is little else than a continuous range of moors and war forests. I get ill with quiet mountain in the morning, and have said he wild enough for any civilised orders. A veritable son of Cockey, named Nicholas, contemptuously, riding on and entering the golf of the lost side of his favourite hill, through glimpses were occasionally caught through the trees of the lovely valley the law. Some time afterwards, the party turned off on the left, and we gently arrived at the gate, and admitted them to the Part. Five minutes canter over the spring turf, then brought them to the house. The manor of Rebbe or Reed really came into possession of the noble family in the time of Edward and extended on one side within a mile of all way from which township it was divided by a deep woody ravine, taking its name from the little village of Saddam, and on the other stretch far into Pendle Forest. The hall was situated on an eminence forming part of the heights of Haddian and faced a wide valley watered by the Calder and consisting chiefly of barren tracts of moor and forest land, bounded by the high hills near Accrington and Rosendale. On the left, some half dozen miles off lay Burnley, and the great part of the land in this direction, being unenclosed and thinly peopled, had a dark dreary look that served to enhance the green beauty of the well-cultivated district on the right. Behind the mansion, thick woods extended to the very confines of Pendle Forest, of which indeed they originally formed part, and here, if the course of the stream flowing through the village of Saddam were followed, every variety of great glen and dingle might found. Reedhall was a large and commodious mansion with a centre and two advancing wings, three sides of a square, between which was a grass plot ornamented with a dial. The gardens were laid out in the taste of time, glittering alleys and arteries, terraces and steps, stone statues and glittering. The house was kept well and consistently by its owner, who looked like a country gentleman with a good estate, entertained his friends hospitably, but without any parade, and was never needlessly lavish in his expenditure, unless perhaps in the instance of a large, ostentatious, huge erect by him in the parish church of Warley, and which Considering he had a private chapel at home and maintained the domestic chaplain's duties, it seemed little required and drew upon him the censure of the neighbouring gossips who said it was more by than religion in The chapel as a whole, a curious history, was afterwards connected, converted into a dining room by a descendant of Roger Norwell. The apartment was incautiously occupied by the planner of the alteration before the plaster was thoroughly dried, in consequence of which he caught a severe cold and died in the desecrated chamber. The state was put on as a judgment. Many good qualities Roger Norwell was little wise, his austere and sarcastic manner held his people, and his harshness made him an object of dislike and dread amongst his inferiors. Besides being the terror of all individuals, he was a hard man in his view, so he endeavoured to be able to persuade himself. So a year or two before, having been appointed to share of the county, he had discharged the important office of his own steel and ability, as well as liberty, that he knows considerably in the way execution. It was during this period that Mass Hearts came and burned his body. Lancaster, and a little attorney's shrewdness gained in an excellent finding of the 
watching all the world was a widow and a police who decided to give him his marriage and had a bank place for that of all this was a high watching all the world was to learn to seek their belief to still in the full vigor of mind and body and temper and active habits and even held that he was offered a fair and obscure brain somewhat bent in his shoulders and a very sharp feature grey eyes a broad mouth and prominent chin his hair was white as silver his eyebrows were still black and bushy and seeing the party approach the lord of the mansion came forth to meet them and beg them to dismount for a moment so Richard excused himself with Nicholas Strangle, his saddle and pot so somewhat more slowly imitated with his example and open door admitted them to the entrance hall where a repast was spread of which the horse pressed his guests to partake from Nicholas declined on the sore of having just breakfasted notwithstanding which he was easily prevailed upon to take a cup of ale leaving him to discuss it nor well led the attorney to a well furnished library where he usually transacted his magisterial business and held a few minutes private conference with him after which they returned to Nicholas and by this time the magistrate's own horse being brought round the party mounted once more the attorney regretted abandoning his seat for Flint indulged him with another exhibition somewhat similar to the first sort of less duration but a vigorous application of the hunting whip brought the wrong headed little animal to reason elated by the victory he had obtained over Flint and anticipating a successful issue to the expedition Master Potts was in excellent spirits and found a great deal to admire in the domain of his honoured and singular good client though not very genuine his admiration was deservedly bestowed. The portion of park they were now traversing was extremely diversified and beautiful, with long sweeping lawns studded with fine trees, among which were many ancient bones now in full bloom and richly scenting the gale. Herds of deer were nipping the short grass, browsing the lower spray of the ashes or couching amid the ferny hollows. It was now that Nicholas, who had been all along anxious to try the speed of his horse, paused to Richard a gallop towards a clump of trees about a mile off, and the young man ascending away they started, Master Potts started too, but Flynn did not like to be left behind, but the metal some pony was soon distanced. Richard had to make a considerable circuit to join his cousin, and while he was going round, Nicholas looked out for the others. In the distance, he could see Roger Norwell riding leisurely on, followed by Sparshot and a couple of grooms, who had come with their master from the hall, while midway to his surprise, he perceived Flynn galloping without a rider. A closer examination showed the squire what had happened. Like himself, Master Potts had incautiously approached the swamp, and getting entangled in it, was thrown head foremost into the slough, out of which he was now floundering, covered from head foot with inky coloured slime. As soon as they were aware of the accident, and two grooms pushed forward, and one of them galloped after Flynn, whom he succeeded at last in catching, while the other, with difficulty preserving his countenance at the woeful plight of the attorney, who looked as black as a negro, pointed out a cottage in the hollow which belonged to one of the keepers, and offered to conduct him thither. Potts gladly assented, and soon gained the little tenement where he was being washed and rubbed down by a couple of stout wenches. When the rest of the party came up, it was impossible to help laughing at him, but Potts took the merriment in good part, and to show he was not disheartened by the misadventure, as soon as circumstances would make, he mounted on the corner, and the cavalcade set forward again.